Calvary Baptist Church. We're glad to have you here this morning. There's a bunch of people over next door, and they're making their way over here. And uh, what, a, what a blessing is. I'm going to read you a, a letter from Brenda Darcy. Brenda sends a little note to the church. She wants to thank each of us for your prayers and expressions of love, care, and kindness during her hospital stays and her heart surgery when she had her pacemaker put in over the last couple of weeks. She says, you're loved and appreciated. God bless each of you. Brenda Darcy. Now, Brenda's been uh, having a rough time the last couple of nights trying to get the pacemaker adjusted to her and everything else. Right, Johnny? Right. So we want to just continue to keep praying for Brenda as she, uh, as she uh, works through these, these challenges with the pacemaker and that. And, uh, Johnny's going to need a pacemaker before it's all over and done with. Also, we want to pray for Debbie Darcy. Debbie, everybody say hi to Debbie. Hi. Uh, she might be watching by online in the hospital. She gets moved, right, tomorrow morning, sometime tomorrow to Grady General. And uh, she had for surgery on her foot, and she cannot put any weight on her foot at all. Otherwise, she's got to go back in for surgery. She's got to stay off of it for seven months weeks, correct? So she's going to be up at the Cairo swing bed there for about two weeks. About two weeks. And that's so let's pray for Neil and Debbie as they, they work on taking care of those things there as well. Um, glad to have you here. And this morning we're going to lift up praise to God in his name. Amen. Amen. And I want you to listen on as we sing all hail King Jesus.
in our home. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, thank you that you lovingly sent your son so graciously you gave him to us for our perfect sacrifice. Father, we, we turn and we lift up praise to you today. Father, you are worthy of our praise. And our praise as it ascends to you as a sweet-smelling Savior, a sweet-smelling offering to you. We pray, Lord, that it would just you would just touch our hearts this morning through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Don't forget to sit down yet. Yeah, we've got another song here. Uh, we're going to have a little intermission in here, though. So. Sunday afternoons there. They had some 
good exciting times with the young people and the kids and the folks there and at the campgrounds. And I don't know what they're eating. Is that papaya or something like that? Anybody know what that is? Pears. <laughs> it's pears. <laughs> I don't know. Who knows? Could be. Looks like they even play volleyball over there. Look at that. I wonder if they play by the Calvary rules. <laughs> Maybe we need to send Lex over and teach them the rules of Calvary. But here's the outside of the, the boy, I tell you what, the church has grown up, hasn't it? Yeah. Look at there, the, all the, the shrubbery. They need us some, some trim work over there, too. But that's the outside of the Trinity Calvary, Calvary Trinity Baptist Church there, or Trinity Calvary, whichever, I can't remember which way it is. But uh, good to have that. I'm going to ask the men to come forward from the morning gifts of tithes and offerings. Oh, I did. I, I'm so sorry. Thursday night. Thursday night, 7 p.m. 6 30. Oh, I didn't see there. There it is. Women's ministry. 6 30. Y'all having steaks? I have. You have no clue. Okay. Celebrating your anniversary. There you are. Thank you. Appreciate they have a cake for that. All right. Women's ministry at Thursday night, 6 30. And then. They've got, I think it's on the Monday, right? Got the ESL classes, the ladies, and then the men will have it the week after. So we've got some stuff going on there. Uh, Wayne, you've got the microphone there. Why don't you give the blessing on your offering? Let's pray. Our grace stand and Father, we come to you this morning, Lord, with thanksgiving and praise for all the many blessings you bestow upon us. Lord, we just thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace and your hope, Lord, that you, you've given us through Jesus Christ. Lord, we just uh, thank you, Lord, for the rain that you've given this past week, Lord. It helped cool us down just a little bit, Lord, and we just, we just thank you and praise you for that. Lord, for those who are sick in our church and our community and our church family, Lord, do you know that, that the list is, is, is quite long, Lord, but you know each one individually, and, and Lord, we just pray that you just uh, wrap your, your healing and loving arms around each one, Lord. Just lift them up and uh, heal them as in your will. Lord, we just uh, pray for our church. We just thank you for our pastor, Lord, as he stands before us today. Lord, we just pray that you just give him the message that you'd have us to hear. And Lord, now for this offering we're about to receive, we just ask that you just take it and bless it and use it for the ongoing of your kingdom. In Christ's sake, amen. amen. <laughs> And then when I'm getting ready in the morning, 
All I do is I put on some red lipstick right there, and then I put on some gloss, and then I do this little mascara thing, and that is it. Oh, wait, no, there's something very important that I do. This is probably one of the most important things I do. Okay, I have a cowlick right here. So if I let my hair like dry naturally, this part right here sticks straight up. So every morning, I dry my hair with this hair dryer. Now let me show you how it works. Oh, it's not turning on. Why isn't it working? This hair dryer is not plugged in. The only way this hair dryer will work is if I plug it in right here or anywhere, but I have to have it plugged into the power source and then, uh-oh. Okay, now it is working. And the reason it's working is because it's plugged into the power source. That's how Christians are. Did you know that there is a scripture in the Bible that says, God is my strength and power, and he maketh my way perfect in 2 Samuel 22:33. We have to be plugged in to God's power. And you know how we get plugged in to God's power? We pray and read the Bible, exactly, and listen to the preacher. That's how you get plugged in to God. You have to have that conversation with him. And then you have to feel in your heart and do what he's leading you to do. And then whenever you get plugged into God's power, he's going to be leading you to do things and your purpose becomes known and then you can actually live out a wonderful purpose for God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, your power is so important to us. Help us to get plugged in. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, choir, you remember we went over this a little earlier, this song we hadn't sang in a while? So we want to make sure our choir really kind of leads the crowd here and stand and sing before the throne of God. We're standing. <laughs> Does it just take you a long time to stand up? You don't want to stand up. Here we go. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong.
song, and it's got a tremendous message message to it as well. You stop and you think about who you are and everything that you've done. This is all free, by the way. Everything that you've done in your life. People walk up to you and they think about your name and, and what you what you've accomplished, maybe the reputation you've built. But when you stand before God, none of that's going to matter. Because He's going to look at you and then He's going to look at His Son and see that if you've trusted Christ as your Savior, His blood has covered your sin. And it makes you worthy to stand before the throne of God. Amen? amen. That ought to just whoo, get you moving. Amen? amen? Before the throne of God, there's a great white throne judgment. Brother Bill will get to that soon. Well, maybe not too soon. Okay. All right. But uh, God's Word says in Revelation chapter 19, I think it is towards the end, or, or chapter 20 towards the end, it says there was the dead, small and great, stood before the great white throne. And the people that are standing before the great white throne are those that are unsaved. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, the Lamb's Book of Life. And the dead were judged by those things that were written in the books, the things that they did. You know, God's writing everything down. And then, Scripture says, the Savior, God, goes to the Lamb's Book of Life to see if their name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Yes, everything that they did was written here. But he goes to the next book and he looks down the list to find their name. And it's not there. None of this mattered, did it? Is your name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life? That's what's important. We pour so much time into things around us. Is your name written down in the Lamb's Book of Life? That's what's important. Amen? Okay, that was free. All right. I want you to take your phone. Some of y'all y'all have phones, right? Okay. You got a phone, Brother Bill? No phone? Well, you're going to have to be. Kay, do you have a phone? It's at home. All right, you don't bring it to church. Okay. I want, you, I want you to turn to something on your phone. Something that is exciting happened to you. And I want you to share it with the person next to you or around you. If they don't have a phone, there's going to be a few people that are going to be searching. All right, go ahead. Do it quick, real quick. Come on. Show somebody something exciting that happened to you. Come on. Play this, brother. Look at that. Look at that. Isn't that cool? Isn't that awesome? Ah. Woo. Brother Bill, give him one of that. You got a minute. You got all that? All right. Come on. Show, show some people. Oh, good. You know phone back there? Okay. Now, if you do this with young people, you just lost it right there. You just lost it, okay? But uh, you stop and you think, have you ever had something exciting happen to you and you didn't have anybody to share it with? Well, in today's world, what do you do? If something exciting happens to you, what do you do? Come and talk to me. You tell somebody else, you put it on what? Facebook. Facebook. What else do you do? You send a mass email, right? Okay, you tweet about it, whatever. You know, I, I'm not into tweeting or whatever else, but you stop and you think about all these exciting things. 
There was a Chinese farmer that came to a Christian medical missions doctor. And this doctor removed some cataracts from his eyes. And he could see again. He left and he went back. The next day, the doctor saw him walking to the clinic with a line with a rope and at least 20 people on the rope, holding the rope, and he was leading them to the medical tent there so that he could help these other blind people receive their sight. You stop and you think about that. Isn't that what we're supposed to be doing as Christians? We have within us a tremendous gift given to us from God. The gift of eternal life and salvation. And it ought to be so much a part of our life that we want to share it with those that are around us. Just like that farmer did. He wanted to bring others to the truth, to the help that they could receive. We, as you take your Bibles, if you would, turn to Acts chapter 8. We just studied the witness of Jesus of, of, and the death of Stephen. And on the heels of his death, Saul instigated a persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And what happened? It, it caused the members of the church to scatter. They scattered. But rather stopping the spread of the gospel, his persecution scattered the seed into new areas. These, these individuals were so excited about what God had done in their life that they, they went off and they shared God's word all around. And it started to impact people. Our text shows the gospel spreading into Samaria, especially through the ministry of a, the man Philip called Philip the Evangelist. He was another one of these table waiters, okay? Just like Stephen. He was a table waiter. That was there. And we're going to see as we, this, as we look at this text today that the gospel of God is his power of salvation. And we need to share it no matter where we're at. Stop and think about it. Can you share God's word in what you do throughout the week? I was down picking up my loader. I don't know, I was doing something. And uh, a gentleman came in, and I thought he was delivering a package, and uh, that was new bolts and stuff that I needed for my trailer, and uh, at Martin Marine in Carabell, Florida. And it wasn't, he was, he was just some guy from the, the community, Carabell community there doing a, a, some type of a census, all right? And so we started talking. And, you know, we, I started asking questions. And, and it was just one-on-one. -on -one. And I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to go go through the door. I said, hey, do you go to church anymore? No, not really. And so I said, oh, if you were to die today, where would you spend eternity? You know, you can ask questions as God opens the door. You know, and you can see as you start to share the gospel, whether it's a red light, <laughs> yeah, they're just really a, in opposition, or whether it's kind of yellow, uh, you, you can continue pr moving forward, or whether it's a green light, man, put the pedal on metal and go. All right, listen, you can sh can you share God's word with what you do? We ought to be able to share God's word. Amen. Amen. These folks were scattered throughout the region and they were sharing God's word. And in our text, we're going to see that Philip shared God's word instead of hiding and staying quiet, instead of fearing and being quiet, they spread God's word. So let me ask you this question. Why should we share God's word? Why must we share God's word? Well, take your Bibles, look at Acts chapter 8. Beginning with verse number one, we'll back up a little bit here. And Saul was consenting unto his death. What does that mean? He was giving approval to it. All right? Yes! Throw that referee out of the game. Throw him. You know, or whoever, okay? You know, we're consenting to all the different things we're cheering to. That's what Saul was doing. 
And at that time, there was great persecution against the church, was, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church. What was Saul trying to do? Saul was trying to destroy the church. This is Paul, all right? Saul was trying to destroy the church. Can you destroy God? And there's people today that are trying to destroy God, will they not? Can you destroy somebody that spoke the sun and the moon and everything into existence? Who are we trying to fool? Saul was making havoc of the church, it says. He was trying to destroy it, entering into every house. And what was he doing? He was dragging men and women off and committing them to prison. He traveled down to Tap and Betty Joe's house and hauled them out and dragged them off to prison, okay? That's what Saul was doing. Therefore, verse 4, they were scattered abroad, went everywhere preaching the word. And Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Verse 6, it says here, and he says, And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing, seeing the miracles which he did. You see, we see here in this passage that we have to share God's word because it's the power of God unto salvation. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus told the disciples, look back at Acts chapter 1. It seems like it was actually 19 messages ago. All right, Acts chapter, Acts chapter 1, verse number 8, he said unto the people, he says, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Say it with me. Jerusalem. Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria. Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. He said, listen, you guys are going to take this, and you're going to share my word with everyone. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power, it's the dynamite. You ever see something blow up? I think about the beaver dams over at Gene Mitchell's and, you know, putting some, you know, tannerite in there and shooting them, you know. Folks, it's the power of God, he says here, unto salvation to everyone that believe it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. This meant that the gospel is for everyone. Let's say that. The gospel is for what? Everyone. Everybody. It's for everyone. You know, the apostles, for some reason, it says in, in verse number two or three, it says the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. Why did they stay here? Maybe they were through running. They had been running all their lives. Okay, maybe that was, maybe that was part of it. Maybe, they, maybe there were some personal hurdles they had to overcome. Either way, our story goes to Samaria. And this this evangelist Philip pioneers the way among, among the villages that were, that were there. You see, the gospel crosses every barrier known to man. As we go on through the book of Acts, you guys are going to find out that the apostles had some hurdles in their life that they had to get over. And Samaria was part of that hurdle. We're going to see that as, as it starts to, as, as the, the church changes from the center of Jerusalem to Antioch. Because Jerusalem kind of just got stuck. The gospel is for who? Come on, talk to me. It's for everyone. God's word jumps every barrier known to man. God's word is, the, is the, the message that needs to go forth to everyone in our world today. As you stop and you listen to the news and as you hear the different things, you're, you, you hear about all these different ideologies that are being promoted to segregate people and put people against people. 
If you can't beat them, you have to divide them. And God's word jumps over every barrier that man can make. And we're going to see that in this passage. In fact, in fact, as we go through this passage today, there's an amazing work that took, that took place in Samaria. And some of the apostles had to go down and see what was going on in Samaria. Amazing. The gospel's for everyone. The gospel is for everyone. He said, what it, what it, 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 as we see in John chapter 4, verse 9, there had been centuries long hatred between the Jews and the Samaritans. By Jesus' day, the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. In fact, what would they do? They would walk around Samaria so that they wouldn't defile themselves by walking through it. In fact, some of the, the Jewish people wouldn't even touch a utensil or a cup that was used by a Gentile, a common person, or a Samaritan, because they didn't want to be defiled by it. That's some pretty harsh ways to live, is it not? They would have some pretty ugly things thrown at them today. And yet, God's word says in Acts chapter 1, Jesus, verse 8, it says, You're going to take my word, Jerusalem, Judea, and what? Samaria. Samaria. Can you imagine? Did, did, Lord, did you really mean Samaria? Okay. All right, well, Samaria, they're, they're Jewish people. They're just a little lower class Jewish people. We get that. But unto the uttermost parts of the earth, it means that every person from every race, and every culture is a candidate for the gospel. Everyone. Everyone is a candidate for the gospel. And we need to take God's word to everyone. Notice as we, as we read the passage here, Philip didn't change his message. He, he took God's word, the gospel, for these, to these people. Look at verse 7. Jump down and look at verse number 7. And we start to see that the gospel is power enough, powerful enough to save those who are entrapped by Satan. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them. And many had taken with palsies and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. There were some tremendous things going on. Look at verse number 9. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to whom they had great regard because of that of a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. Many of these Samaritans were under the spell of this satanic deceiver, Simon, called sometimes Simon Magnus. All right, Magnus comes from the, the Latin word for great or the Greek word for magic. All right, Whether he had satanic power to perform these miracles or whether he was a master magician. You ever like to see the magic stuff that goes on? Whether he was a master magician who used trickery to amaze the masses, he was obviously a tool of Satan. But even where there's demonic and satanic influences, guess who's stronger than that? God is. God's, power, God's word is powerful, and the gospel is stronger. You see... We don't, need, we don't need to fear to share God's word with people that are under satanic influences. Why? Because Satan is in the religion business up to his ears. It's just his religion is different than God's, is it not? The people from the smallest to the greatest were, were giving attention to him. His Simon's satanic sorcery successfully saturated all levels of the society. Try to say that sentence in, in real quick. I, I was like, I'm going to start spitting when I say that. All right. Simon's satanic sorcery 
saturated all the levels. But this didn't stop Philip from preaching. In fact, what did he do? He proclaimed the gospel to the Samaritans. What did he do? He focused on the person and the work of Jesus Christ. He focused on what God had done for them and what he had provided for them. What a tremendous blessing to hear the gospel message. And the Samaritans responded. They responded. Look at verse 12. Jump down to verse number 12. It says, but when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and the signs which were done. These people in the, in the city of Samaria, they believed and they went and got baptized. Notice it. They were believed, they believed God's word, and then they went out and followed him in believers' baptism. Amazing. But verse 13 gives us a little bit of an interesting turn. He says, but then Simon himself also believed. It doesn't tell us what Simon believed. Now, there's scholars on both sides. Some people say, well, this guy trusted Christ as a savior, and others say he didn't. All right? I'm kind of on the uh, idea that We'll see what happens in the passage here and it begins to reveal what's truly in his heart. Did he believe in Philip's preaching? Or did he, was he amazed by the miracles that were being done by Philip? You know, people can make false professions of faith and they can even follow believers in believers' baptism. But only God knows a person's heart. You know, I, I stop and I think about this. How can somebody come to church? How can somebody get involved in God's word? And there not be a heart change if they trust Christ as their savior. Do you follow me on that? You know, when, when you trust Christ as your savior, there, there needs to be a change in our heart, does there not? Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are becoming new. There's a change. And, and you are the only one that truly knows whether you know Christ as your Savior or not. Simon believed. I don't know what he believed or if he was just amazed by what the things that were going on because the magicians in those days, they're just like... You know, if you watch America's Got Talent, you say, oh, man, that's a cool thing what that guy just did. I wonder how he does that. All right. And so what they, what, what they do, they go up and they talk to that person. Say, how did you do that? Now, I'll give you some money for this, okay? And uh, I'd like to learn that. And, and they're just amazed at some of these new things. All right. Philip was bat Philip baptized Simon. And, but yet, as it shows in the passage, Simon seemed to be a professor and not a possessor of Christ. John MacArthur said this. He said in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are becoming new. He says, faith that does not transform the life is not a saving faith. Which kind of leads us to our next point. Look at verse number 14 where we find out that not everyone who says they believe is truly saved. Look at verse 14. As we read here, it says, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. You get it? All the apostles are back at Jerusalem. It's not too far away. And Peter and John, hey, better go down to see what's going on in Samaria. All right? Who, verse 15, when they were come down, pray for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was not fallen upon none of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying of the, on of the hands of the apostles, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay my hands on, he may receive the Holy Ghost. And this kind of gives us the idea that Simon was just saw something that was exciting taking place, and he wanted to be a part of it. How do I become a part of this exciting thing that's, being, that's taking place? And he looked at this, 
And he, he saw this impressive higher power. When Peter and John came, and he liked what he saw, just didn't understand what the Holy Spirit was all about or what God and His Word. And so what does Simon, Peter do to Simon? He rebukes him. In verse number 20, he comes back and he, he starts to, to put truth on the table. And Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. He goes on to tell him that is, in verse number 21, he says, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, and perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the, the gall, or full of bitterness, and in the bond, being bound by iniquity. Something else was going on in Simon's heart, and Peter put truth on the table to them. And he rebukes them. He used some strong language. But look at Simon's response to Peter. Pretty interesting. His response to Peter is very lame. Then he answered Simon, verse 24. Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. It would be like me talking to Brother Bill and saying something to Brother Bill, and Brother Bill comes back and says, Well, Brother Rob, why don't you pray to God for me, that none of these things. You know, folks, if there's something wrong in my heart, in my life, and it's exposed, to me, I'm going to go and take it to the Lord in prayer. Amen? And ask Him for forgiveness. There's not a, a day that goes by that I don't have to go before God and ask for forgiveness of things in my life. I don't have somebody else praying for me, do I? I have to go to God's throne. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to what? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know, it's not somebody else going to God for me. It's me. And this kind of shows Simon's heart here. He says, he gives this lame response to Peter. And it kind of points out that this, this story reveals two contrasts between those who have a genuine saving faith in Christ and those who have a false faith. You see, true repentance equals a change of heart and a change of direction. That's what repentance is. When we go to Christ and we ask Him and we trust Him as our Savior, there's a change of heart and change of direction. That's what God's Word talks about. Salvation is a matter of changing your, of God changing your heart. He takes, as it says in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, He takes your heart of stone and replaces it with a heart of flesh. He makes you a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Simon wanted this new power for himself so that people would be impressed on how great he was. Folks, there was a difference here. You stop and you think about your life. When you trusted Christ as your Savior, is there, has there been growth? Has there been that, that process of where you are growing closer to Him in your life? That's important. That's important. Your walk with God is paramount. That's how you grow closer to God. That's how God opens your eyes and your heart to things in your life that need to be put off and the things that need to be put on. That's the process of sanctification. It's a daily journey. It's not a list of rules of do's and don'ts. It says as you grow closer to God and your love for your Savior is tremendously stronger, you do things because you want to please the Savior. 
You want to do those things that he can say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what it's important. That's why it's important to grow in Christ. That's why you know, I say, hey, what's your walk with the Lord like? As you grow and as you walk with God, as you grow in, in his word, as you get into his word, as you study it, it's going to shine a light into your heart and life. And there's a change. You see, also, we, we see in this passage here that the Holy Spirit lives within those who know Christ. Now, follow with me. And you look at the book of Acts. Acts is a transitional book. All right. At the beginning, it shows there, there was a transitional period of time when the believers trusted Christ as their Savior and then received the Holy Spirit later on. We see that a number of times all throughout. Okay, here in our passage, we see the Samaritans trusted Christ as their Savior. But then the Holy Spirit came at a little, a little later time. Then, as you get down into the chapter 18 and that, you'll find the, the people in Caesarea, in Cornelius, they, they, trust, they trusted Christ as their Savior. And then the Holy Spirit just was there. You see, folks, the book of Acts is a transitional book. But the clear teaching of the New Testament is that after this transitional period, all believers receive the Holy Spirit through faith at the moment of salvation. We see this in Galatians chapter 3, verses 2 through 5. He indwells our body. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? You've been bought with the price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are his. You see, when you trusted Christ as your Savior, guess who came and lived inside of you? The Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. That's why he says we're supposed to walk in the Spirit so that we don't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. We're supposed to strive. We're supposed to walk daily with God, allowing His Spirit to fill us. And so what happens when we get squeezed? When the fruits get squeezed, you squeeze the lemon, what comes out? Orange, hey, orange juice, right? <laughs> no. When you squeeze the lemon, you get watermelon, right? When you squeeze a lemon, you get apple juice. No. When you squeeze a lemon, what comes out? You get lemon juice, right? And when you squeeze a Christian, what should come out? The fruit, love, joy, peace, long stuff. Folks, it's a growing process. The Samaritans received the Holy Spirit when Peter and John uh, came down and, uh, and they received the Holy Spirit. Verse 17. What a tremendous blessing. Truly, these believers re received the Holy Spirit and like, like we do at the moment of salvation. Folks, listen. It's imperative that we walk with God. Lastly, we see in our passage here, verse number 25. It says that we must share the gospel no matter where we are. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of God, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Peter and John, they started sharing God's word in all the different places where they were. Folks, whether you face trials, persecution, disappointment, hardship, anything you face in life, it's an opportunity to share God's word. Amen? Amen? Somebody's broken down on the side of the road. You pull up and you help them out. And you start sharing as you're working. And you can share God's word. It's, there's people that are out there that are hungry for God's word. They're hungry for encouragement. They may know God as, as their personal Lord and Savior. They just need a word of encouragement. And God has brought you along for that opportunity. God uses trials in our lives to expand the gospel. Just like these people were scattered in Jerusalem. Why, to make life miserable for them? No, they had to leave their home. They had to leave everything that they had built and share God's word. And they were blessed. 
They were scattered, and the seed of the gospel was going everywhere. They proclaimed Christ no matter where they were at. You stop and you think about this, folks. If you are in a time of trial, ask the Lord for the opportunity to use your circumstances to tell others about Christ. You may be in the hospital. You may be here. You may be there. Use those opportunities to share Christ. We also see the responsibility that every believer has to proclaim the gospel. If you know Christ as your Savior, guess what? You have a responsibility to share God's Word. You can't avoid it. It's like that finger, Uncle Sam. You know that portrait? No matter where you were, that finger was pointing at you. <laughs> That's the way it was. It's like it's God's Word. He said, listen, share my word. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. There's a change that takes place. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. There's a change. As we wrap up and we think about this message today, you need to remember that God's word is the power of God unto salvation. It's for everyone. That means the Peters and Johns and the apostles of our life need to lay aside those prejudices that they had in their heart and realize that God's love jumps every barrier known to man. And he is asking us to take his love to everyone. Amen? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for Philip stepping forward, going out and sharing the gospel. Father, thank you that your word is powerful. Thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit guides and, and leads us as he indwells us. Father, there's there's many of us today. Yes, we are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, but we're not yielding as we ought to. Maybe today would be a day that we just bow the knee to God and say, Lord, here's my life. I want to grow closer to you. I want to draw closer to you. I want to grow in my relationship with you. Father, help us to see the need before us. Help us to see the harvest around us. Help us to, to take your word to everyone. As our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, let me ask you a couple of questions. Maybe you're here this morning and you need to let God's power and his word change your life. God's power does not depend on your personality. God's power is in him alone. And as we yield to him, he'll use us for his glory. Folks, why not bow the knee to God and his word today? Why not be willing to step out, venture out like Philip did and share God's word? I think of those people that scattered. They had to yield and let God use them. And they took their difficulty and spread God's word. I don't know what's going on in your world today, but God does. And he can take you and use you in an amazing way. All we need to do is yield to him. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Brother Rob, I've never trusted Christ as my Savior. Why not trust him today? Why not trust him today? 
Maybe you're here and you've trusted Christ as your Savior. You've never followed Him in believer's baptism. Why not step out? You say, well, if I do that, there's going to be a whole change. Why not? Sometimes we're so fearful of what we're going to give up that we miss out on the universe of what God is going to grant us in return. Folks, some of us just need to get busy, get active, and share God's Word. Father, we come to You. We, we bow before the old rugged cross. Father, as we sit and we think about the cross and what You did for us, Help it, help that memory, help that, the thought of that to overwhelm us such that we are willing to step out for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand together, heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm going to ask the ladies to play that old familiar song. God's worked on your heart. You come. You come. sing that song together. Think about what you cling to and cling to the cross. Let's sing it. On a hill far away stood on some prayer this morning. Pray for those that are in the hospital, those that are trying to get adjusted in their medicine as well. Amen. Father in heaven, thank you for a message of the gospel. We've heard and we've experienced the gospel. And we pray others would have ears to hear the good news and the glad tidings because the gospel does have power 
Paul said, I'm not ashamed of that message because it is the power. It's the authority. It's the way people come to know the Lord. It's the power of God to salvation. We pray that you'd seal these truths and the, and the power of this message in every heart. We do pray for those that are suffering maladies this morning. Some are in the hospital. Some are recovering at home. Maybe some even here today that need, Lord, you touch a healing and strength. And we pray that you'd raise them up and answer a prayer that we might rejoice with them. Lord, thank you for your, for your healing power and for your encouraging power and your help. I pray especially for those that are, uh, Lord, in hospitals and recovering from procedures. And I pray for their rapid recovery, restore their strength and rehab. And we thank you for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.